I used to wake up with anxiety, go to sleep with anxiety. Um, every day I used to get panic attacks. Um, and every other day I used to be in the bathroom just crying my eyes out. Life is short, but it's also very long. And it's very, it's, it's a paradox, right? But like, you're 18 and 19, it's like, maybe figure out what you don't like doing and then you'll get to what you like doing. School will tell you certain narratives. Your parents will tell you certain narratives. Your social circles will tell you certain narratives. But like, who are you? As an individual, if you want to build your own network, if you want to just improve on communication as a skill set, it's a fantastic place to get. A lot of conflict yeah. can be resolved if you just give it 20 minutes. And like just every day visualizing that something's going to come of it. And when it actually did come, when we raised that around, we hit those certain milestones, revenue wise, we built a team, grew it from like four people to 20 people. Like, that was when it was like, you, you, you wake up one day and you're like, you know, you pause from work, you go on a walk and you're like, oh my god, like. Hello everyone, welcome to the Breaking Uneven podcast. We love to talk shop, uncover the beauty of failures and play a few games. Today we have with us the co-founder of Let's Level Up, Varun Basara. Both of us actually went to school together and then you went to the University of Warwick um, and studied digital innovation and entrepreneurship. And while you were studying, you founded Connect Us, and you were also the host of the podcast, The Human Entrepreneur. And once you graduated, you then founded Let's Level Up. So have you missed anything? No, I think that's, that's a <laughs> fairly good introduction. Perfect. So to get started, we play a quick little game to learn a little bit more about Let's Level Up. All right. So Twitter is known for its 280 character limit, which sometimes makes it a little difficult to convey your thoughts. So what we've done is we've transfer this to a challenge for you. It takes two, 20 seconds to speak to 80 characters. So you need to explain to us, let's level up in 20 seconds, but it's not that easy. You also need to use one emoji and one hashtag in your tweet. Okay. okay. Yeah, got it. So Johnny's going to put a little bit of a timer to intimidate you. Three, two, one, go. Well, let's level up. Uh, we're a business in a box solution for experts and coaches. Um, and we have them build, scale, and launch their online education businesses. The hashtag would be leveling up, and the emoji would be a uh, rocket. Ooh, 15 seconds. Nice. Not bad. Yeah. This is what, like our 10th rocket emoji? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. It's like, I think now it's become the symbol of every like startup. Growth. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Gen Z startups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the. No, but yeah, okay, before we come to Let's Level Up, like, let's go back. Um, we went to, like, school together, and then after school, you took a gap year. Um, so, yeah, what was the motivation for taking a gap year before you went to university? I think that's a very, very lovely question. Uh, I think the gap year was more like me just taking a pause from everything, from school. You know, you, you're always told in school that you need to do A, B, and C, and then you need to go to university, and you need to find a job. And like in that entire span, like nobody asks you what you really want to do. And so I sat with my parents, uh, and interestingly, our principal in school encouraged gap years. So it came at a very interesting time where I said, look, I don't know what I want to do with my life. Like, had I not done my gap year, I'd probably have done economics in university. But I'm glad I didn't do that. So I took a gap year just to create that pause between like school and university, just to figure out what is it that I don't want to do. Um, eventually I thought I'd figure out what I'd like to do, but I, the more I got into like the gap year, I realized like, okay, here are the things I don't like. So like by elimination, I got to what I liked. And I think that was the idea behind taking that one year off. Yeah. I think it's like easier to do it by elimination versus like yeah. trying to find exactly what you want to do. I think it's so hard to do that even like during university or post university. But I feel like all of us are trying to like yeah. find exactly. But yeah, interesting that our principal promoted it because like not a lot <laughs> of like people were taking gap years yeah. back then. But um, yes, yeah, so like what did you do in your gap year and like one learning from your gap year? So the way I structured the gap year was uh, in a couple of parts. So one was like, who am I as a person? Like, what is it that I really want to do? And, and you know, we all fight demons in school. So like just taking, taking time off, like just figure out myself. The second was like, can I do something where I can impact in a certain way my own career trajectory? And then the third was just like hobbies and like just doing things I never thought I'd want to do or try doing. I saw the last one. So the last one I played uh, I played a lot of instruments growing up but the one instrument I never played was the guitar 
So I started learning to play the guitar. Uh, the second one was, the middle one was career. So in that, I basically tried to maximize every possible internship I could possibly find. Now, having said that, I may not have enjoyed most of the internships I did, but I also <laughs> realized that like what I really like doing is building stuff and maybe working in teams where I'm actually creating a lot more impact than just being told what to do. And so that was, I think, where the itch of like building stuff and like this entrepreneurial like bug started coming in. And then the first was like just fighting my own demons, what I call like just introspectively understanding what I need to be doing better as a human being and like who am I. So I did therapy uh, for, for that one year. Um, I mean, we can keep, we can go into mental health in a bit, but like that was my first time where I just sat with a therapist and actually started understanding what was going on in my head. And then I also did this uh, inner engineering course by Sadhguru. I don't know if you've heard yeah. of um, You know, that actually changed a lot for me because like, it introduced me to like a proper form of meditation, which I'd never experienced uh, and a state of mind, which I had not experienced before. Uh, so I, I think all those experiences actually helped me. And of course, like underlying all of that was like, okay, can I do a little bit of, you know, can I, can I learn a few tasks? I did a bunch of different courses. Uh, I took up like this degree online uh, from this Harvard Extension School. Um, I did all of that as well. But I think the most important thing was just like figuring out like what I didn't want to do to then be able to know, okay, here's what I want to do. Uh, and then that was the biggest learning. I think the one other learning, if I, if I can add, I think with the gap year especially, it's like there's this expectation to know everything at the very beginning. But we're, we're like 18 and 19, like you're not supposed to know everything and you will figure it out. Uh, and just holding that perspective is very important. Like life is life is short, but it's also very long. And it's very, it's, it's a paradox, right? But like you're 18 and 19, it's like maybe figure out what you don't like doing and then you'll get to what you like doing. You know, to be honest, I believe that even when you're 40, you don't know any, everything. Yeah. Like you can never know everything. If, yeah. you, if you know everything, then you're too comfortable. Yeah. And that's kind of like, yeah, then you're just not like learning anymore. So I know for a fact that even if, like when I'm 50, I want to be in a space where I don't know everything. Um, but I'm going to pick on one thing that you said, which is your internships helped you like, you know, figure out what you don't want to do and also that you didn't enjoy, um, them necessarily. So what was your least liked internship and why did you not like it? <laughs> um, I don't think I had any least like, I think that just the, the way in which you're structured when you're in an internship, like you're not given a lot of responsibility yeah. and I thrive on like getting a lot of responsibility. And the other thing is that people don't necessarily take you seriously. So it's not like one particular internship did me wrong or I didn't like it. It's just that the whole idea of like going and being a part of a company where you can't really affect that much change just to then come out of that internship and say you did the internship. Yeah. Just didn't, it wasn't something for me. So when I like to work on something, I like to like affect change. And if I can't do that in a very meaningful way, it just doesn't motivate me. So then it's just like waking up every day, doing the same things, doing, you know, cause you're made to do stuff, you're given work yeah. <laughs> rather than it actually the work impacting the organization or the, or the people around you. I think that was where I think there was this, this thing of like, wait, if I'm doing all of this for somebody else, can I probably not just try out something for myself and just do it for me? And then if I can do that, then can I impact and affect change in my own way, in my own life, doing the things that I like to do? Yeah. So that was, I think, where uh, I, didn't, I didn't answer your question. Uh, exactly. <laughs> no, you did. Like, you did. I think, yeah, I think yeah. so. Personally, I feel like the internship system in India is a little broken. Um, again, I say India because I know the context. I, I'm not going to speak anything about global, but basically, like for example, I come from. I am in the advertising sector, right? And at the risk of uh, annoying people that I work with, there is this idea of lack of talent in the industry. But then, if you ask any agency how, what they do with the interns. It's again, the gun pull, right? The no, no responsibility stuff. Well, Hey, if you're not going to like gauge your talent, if you've got, if you're taking 30, 40 interns a year and you're not going to gauge their talent. And then when you go to hire, you're just going to like open it up, then you're missing out on potential candidates. So I, I totally get, um, like why you feel. What but I think, doing. I think it's a lovely experience to, to go through that uh, for me at least, because I then knew exactly what to do when I was hiring my team. Yeah. Like everything that annoyed me, I stripped away and now we have a very well-defined process that I think, you know, people have said it's not scalable or whatever. I just completely disagree with that. But like we've rewritten the rules of how we hire uh, at Let's Have It Up today. 
And so had I not gone through that process of not liking something, yeah. I would probably not have come to this realization. Fair, but now you have to get into that a little more. So what are the rewritten rules? So of? one of the things that we do at Let's Level Up is we don't see your CV. We don't see where you're from. We don't see, um, we don't even look at like, of course, like gender, we're gender blind. We don't look at CVs. Uh, we don't look at um, uh, your name. Um, it doesn't actually matter where in the world you are as long as you can work the hours that we, we're expecting. What we do look at is proof of work. So yeah. what that means is, uh, not a course, but like <laughs> something that you've done that proves that you can do A, B, and C. So let's say I'm hiring for uh, a digital marketing um, uh, lead. I want to see their past experience of running ads for someone. And yeah. it could be as simple as just putting together a portfolio of all your work and what you've done as an outcome. Now, for people that are not necessarily experienced, there's still a lot of ways of building your own portfolio of work. So we actually place a big precedence on that versus anything else. Yeah. And the way we sift through a lot of the, the sort of uh, talent is before the actual proof of work stage, we actually have two very simple questions. Why you, which means you need to sit in front of a camera because most of our work is online. Mm -hmm. and we, so we sit in front of a camera and you tell us why you. So that basically helps us understand how you're carrying yourself out in front of a camera. And the second is what specific skill sets do you have? So like present what you've done. So like your proof of work, but explain. That tells me two things. One is how passionate you are about like us and you and what you've done. And can you explain it in the most simple way? Because then we're testing for communication. When you pass both those stages, then it comes to like a case study interview where we give you a task. Most likely we will even pay you for the task if it's a very big task. And we'll actually give you a context which we're struggling with. Once that happens, then I know like, okay, you're great at communication, you've done your work and you know how to solve a specific problem set in our area, that's when we make the hire. This process has helped us eliminate so many, I mean, this is, we've come to a point where this is a very defined process. We obviously made a lot of mistakes, yeah. a lot of wrong hires, but eventually it just streamlines the process and the quality of the applicant that comes at the end of it is far more significantly better than just seeing a CV and then just going through tons and tons of like these randomized <laughs> interviews. And then you're like, oh, I've made a bad hire. Well, obviously you've made a bad hire because you're not actually tested for the actual skill. Yeah, fair enough. And I think like um, you're getting more quality applicants yeah. and quantity applicants because yeah. like back to when like I was at university and you're just recruiting a lot of times when you reach a point where like you have like the top 10 companies, for example, you want to work at. And when, you, when you're past that, you're just finding places to apply that will take your CV and it's a quick process. <laughs> like from the other point of view, right? Like you're not going to want to give like a two minute recording about this, 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 if you're not truly passionate about it. So yeah, like you are sifting through that entire process early on so that you don't have to deal with, because even like looking at people's CV, it's very time consuming to see and it gets quite blurred after a point because it'll be repetitive in terms of like the kind of experiences one has at the age of, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this at the cost of offending a few people, but like, I think your CV is not a representation of who you are. Yeah. It just never, 100%. It, and you, there's so many things that you can potentially fake in a CV. Like, why would I look at something that's just not very data driven versus looking at proof of work? Yeah. I mean, like, see, like everything when it comes to like <laughs> work, right? Like it can't be just based on data either. Right? Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, hiring a human that has emotions works in a particular way has that sense of like culture behind that makes them who they are right so it can't only be data i think if you want to be data driven it would be more cv -like. yeah i mean what i meant by that was like if i'm if i'm looking at like your context of you as a human yeah. being like all of these things for me is like when i say data i don't mean necessarily numbers but yeah. I mean like these are just points that i like to look at so like yeah. when i'm seeing you record yourself on a video like are you are you looking at the camera are you are you dressed well are you is your body language carrying are you carrying yourself well like all these small nuances, which you can't usually get in a CV. That's what I really meant by like, what is, what I meant by like data. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think uh, at, we've, we've done this now. So like we were hiring for like a product role. We got over 200 applications. But when you initiate that, that level of like, you know, adding that layer of like, okay, send us two videos now. You dramatically, like by about 25, 30%, um, your applicants go down. Yeah. And then you add more layers of complexity and goes down. <laughs> so you're, it's almost like also filtering mechanism to get to like that ideal candidate. 
Yeah. And the person who's motivated enough, enough right? Like yeah. you want exactly. the person that's going to give you their best version yeah. and put in all the effort that they have so that you benefit from that 100%. relationship. Um, but yeah, in terms of before Let's Level Up, you had Connect Us. So that started at uh, Warwick. You also studied in, like entrepreneurship at Warwick. A lot of people are also of the opinion that you can't really learn entrepreneurship. <laughs> so what are your thoughts on that? I 100% agree that you can't learn it in, in, the, in the context of a classroom. Yeah. Uh, what you can do is you can learn it by going through stuff. So you can't necessarily, entrepreneurship is a very hands-on experience. Yeah. Like it's not like I read a book and then uh, otherwise, you know, given the fact that we have so many entrepreneurship books, everybody would become an entrepreneur today yeah. and do very well at it. Uh, so you can learn entrepreneurship, but it's it's a it's a mechanism of like just learning and doing and paying off what I like to call is like this whole idea of ignorance debt. Like you don't know enough, yeah. so you're gonna have to make a lot of mistakes. When you make enough mistakes, you get to a point where you make less mistakes, and those less mistakes help you drive your idea forward. Uh, and that only happens when you do. Uh, you can't think and then not do. Yeah. I think entrepreneurship is a very doing. Ex- it's an act of doing. Um, so I, I think you can learn it, uh, but the way you learn it is not through conventional methods of just reading, it's through doing. I honestly think that with entrepreneurship, what you can do in a classroom is teach a certain mindset. Mm. Um, and yeah, fair enough, that mindset may be taught through experiences, mm. but like now I've been working not as an entrepreneur, but again, as um, a business owner for about two years now. And for me, honestly, what I've learned is just when there's a problem, I, I know I'm not the solution provider. I'm just the framework for how the solution comes mm-hmm. into it. So that's, I think, an entrepreneur's job, right? An entrepreneur is just someone that is going to figure a way out to get the, get the problem yeah. solved, but not actually solve it themselves. Yeah. yeah. So I feel like those are things that can be th- those frameworks and ways of thinking and like, you know, how to go about a problem is what can be taught, but yes, everything else needs to come yeah. with experience. There's definitely like a lot of value in like reading, uh, but like there's this point where you read so much and not do, <laughs> and so like you much rather do than than read. But like of course, like it's a balance, balance. Um, and so I think you know you're right. A, a lot of the times uh, you can think in frameworks, and those frameworks will help you with with solutions or to your problems. But your, every problem is relatively unique. Hundred uh, percent, yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, you, I think reading and like learning helps you create those frameworks. Uh, but I think frameworks and like processes can also get you just so far. I think yeah. at one point it's also the skills you just develop by yeah, doing, by like doing. you're saying, yeah. like like you said. But like, um, because I feel like putting entrepreneurship in like a textbook format yeah. is very difficult because every business like and we've had so many conversations every one of them has such a different outlook on the way they do things yeah or the way they've started like you can't then create the similarities don't get me wrong it's not like all unique but the way the whole path is so different that i feel like if you try and make it into like a framework or a systematic process or like a step guide it's not as yeah easy to replicate yeah No, and I'll tell you, like for me, because I've personally felt this, right? Like we've spoken to more than 40 entrepreneurs now and in every episode, of course, we go into their failures, right? But then it's like, yeah, okay, we had, we we were doing well, we had this failure and then we solved it. Now, I'm certain that for each of them, that journey was terrible, right? Like great, but terrible, terrifying, terrible, all of it. Now. As a business owner myself, when I see it cinched up into a five minute story, I'm thinking, damn, I can't solve my problems like this. Am I doing something wrong? Yeah. But hey, no, that person didn't solve it in five minutes. It probably took them five months. But so I feel like the same thing happens in a book, right? Yeah. Like you see things that are like yeah. getting solved quickly and then you feel like, oh, I'm not going to be able to do this. So there's like a bit of imposter syndrome that's oh, created. 100%. <laughs> I think like a lot of the times these, these podcasts also that like glorify like entrepreneurs, like one of the podcasts that I have loved listening to are the ones that actually dive behind the entire story. And you're right. Most of the times, even like with news or with like these, like these expectations, like someone's raised X million uh, dollars or, uh, you know, you've got to uh, X number of, of, of customers, but like that took time. 
Like yeah. today, this so often I catch myself like saying, "Oh my God, this guy is like way ahead of me." But like he started ten years back. Yeah, I've started only two years back. Like you can't compare apples and oranges. But no one teaches you that. And like you to, there's a certain level of self awareness that comes with like just accepting that like you're not going to be the shit. Yeah. Right now. yeah. Like you will probably get there, but there's always going to be someone better than you. And like you can either look at that better as inspiration or something that you feel really, really shit about. And like, what would you rather choose? For me, I would much rather be someone who takes inspiration. Now, this is Varun one and a half years back would be completely the opposite. But that's <laughs> my growth as well. Yeah. Yeah. Now, okay. So speaking about the Varun one and a half years ago, or maybe even actually before that, when you were. Uh, you're taking a gap year and you took therapy. So, what would you say is the importance of either like therapy or like balancing your mental health while having a company? I think firstly, I think everybody should take therapy, and I, there's a, there's a reason <laughs> for that. I think we we live in a world where there's just so much, so much put on you uh, from your family, from from society. Like there's just just so much baggage that's dumped on you. You don't really have a choice. You just almost accept it growing up. School will tell you certain narratives. Your parents will tell you certain narratives. Your social circle is going to tell you certain narratives. But like, who are you as an individual? Who is who is Janvi or who is Varun? Like, who's Anuj? Like, who are you? And like, what is it that you really want? To unpack all of that, you almost go through therapy as a mechanism to learn what you really want. So it's a it's a it's a it's almost a journey or an exploration into like human behavior of yourself. And I think that is firstly what I think therapy is, and why I say everybody should do it is because it will just give you a much relatively more clearer version of what you want. Simply by talking and carving out time to talk about yourself, which is something we don't really do very often. Yeah. So how has going through therapy helped you build your business? So probably you probably uh, you probably see me in school, right? So. School Varun was extremely ambitious to the point where he wouldn't really care too much about like social interactions. Yeah. Uh, to the point where you know, you know, you you I'd be very abrasive or very aggressive or probably you know not want to talk or maintain relationships because you know what end goal I want to achieve and that's it. What you soon realize if you go down that path, which I did, was the journey becomes incredibly lonely, yeah. and when you're building a company, it becomes even more lonely. Because you don't really have time to meet people, and then if you don't foster certain connections in a, in a in a positive way, you're probably going to get even more lonelier. Now, I'm saying that with extreme clarity today, but it took me a while to get to this point. The other point is like a lot of social narratives that you form growing up. So I I was someone who took a lot of time to learn certain things. So I had like learning disabilities growing up. So I was always told, like in school, you have to double up what everybody else does. But is that really true? And so, like, you unpack that over time to say, okay, like you had learning disabilities then, you've worked on it now, you probably coped with it in various ways. So then, maybe it's not double of what everybody needs yeah. to do. But if I had to live with that constantly, over and over again, I would still today think that okay, if someone's taking one hour to learn something, I need to do it. I need to spend two hours doing it, which is probably not true. So I think those, I think two main examples uh, came up um, in my in my process. Obviously, like I have an anxiety disorder. It's called uh, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, and O and C, like your obsessions and compulsions, take place in various forms. So obsessions are like thought processes that loop, and we can get into how that actually affects me as an entrepreneur and how it did affect me um, even even till today. And then there are these um, uh, com compulsions which are like. So the if the glass is not put in a particular way, I want to put it back in a particular way. So how do you solve for that? Because it gets very debilitating yeah. every day to like try and maximize for how I should be walking or how I should be putting my glass in a particular way. Um, and so I think eventually, like, how do you even cope with that on a daily basis? So that was my third thing. Uh, so I think that it, it it does help. Maybe it's not for everyone. But I think everybody should kind of give it a shot. Unfortunately, the one thing that saddens me the most is there's this extreme stigma attached to it. Yeah, uh, I just wish we could move past that um, in in some way, shape, or form. I mean, this is I'm I'm we're hoping this helps, right? Like I hope talking so. about it openly is just yeah. is what's going to drive stigma yeah. away. But I think so. I agree with everything you said except one thing. I, I do agree that everyone needs to therapize themselves in some way or the other. I 
I feel like there's multiple avenues, right? Yes. Like therapy is one of the avenues, yeah. of course. But there's different ways. Like for me personally, I've tried therapy. Um, it didn't work for me because I'm not the kind of person that likes to like talk a lot. I like to like introspect yeah. and like solve whatever in my brain yeah. itself. So therapy for me is like driving in the car, mm. listening to music, and then just letting my thoughts go wherever. Yeah. So yeah, I agree that everyone needs to therapize themselves and you should find that avenue for yourself, whatever it might be, even if it's therapy. Yeah. So just Anuj, one, one thing on that. So I think, uh, just want to clarify. So there are different kinds of therapy. So there's certain kinds where you talk a lot, there's certain kinds where you reflect a lot, uh, and there's certain kinds where you, it's an eclectic method where you do multiple forms of therapy. And for anybody listening to this, I know this is a sidetrack from like business, yeah. but I think like with therapy, it, it just like this found like this product market fit right in the in the world of business there is a therapy um, there's a patient doctor fit uh, that takes place so not every therapist will be your match and i've gone through a few therapists to be able to get to my match so it's a lot like finding a co-founder or it's a lot like finding product market fit uh, or it's a lot like finding founder market fit um, and the type of therapy that you do depends on who you are uh, so what you're talking about when it comes to, like driving or when it comes to, like letting your thoughts go that's a great way to actually decompress from a day Fair. but fundamentally uh, challenging your thought process takes time so whether you do that with like a life coach whether you do that with a therapist like that's up to you but as long as you can get yourself to understand like what am i thinking where am i going wrong cognitively or where do i need to change i don't think it's a right and wrong thing but like where do i need to change that's where like you'll actually start picking up on patterns yeah when you start picking up on patterns you'll realize okay this pattern actually started way back when my mom told me this or my dad told me this or my teacher told me this and then how do you break that pattern because a lot of the times your mental health your mental struggles come from past i wouldn't say trauma but like past experiences that will shape you today and so like unpacking that and if you can do that on your own or you can do that with somebody yeah. else great however you do it i just feel like people should be doing it a lot more so speaking to you more it seems like you know um you definitely have like a very podcast host vibe and you have had a podcast in the past. So why did you start it and would you encourage someone to start their own and why? Yeah, so I built Connect Us uh, at university. And so Connect Us was this algorithm that we matched over 500 people with at university. And now university has taken it over. The whole idea was to solve for uh, isolation on campus. I felt extremely lonely. So I was like, can I actually find people that I can connect with to go to certain campus events? Now, in that process of building Connect Us, I realized that A, this is an incredibly fun journey, but it's a very lonely journey. And whenever I see myself benchmarking myself with like these entrepreneurs or like whatever the news is telling me, like they're not actually uncovering the, the stuff that you need to go through. You know, it's like eating shit, embracing the suck. Like nobody's talking about those things. So my, the, the thesis I had was, can we actually get people who we think are very inspiring, but not talk about their work. We spend probably 10 minutes talking about what they do and 15 minutes talking about how they got there. And so we go through incredible amounts of pain, struggle, sacrifice to actually uncover who's the human behind that entrepreneur. So by no surprise, the podcast name was the human entrepreneur. And so eventually we got to a place where we were like, I started talking about this. So a few friends said, yes. Um, you know, you know, they were like, oh yeah, yeah, we should do, we should do it. One person stuck, which was my co-host and now my co-founder Luke. Um, and so, I, I, you know, from then on, we were like, okay, there's a shared vision. Uh, there's, you know, something that we're very passionate about. Can we now influence? And the whole angle was around youth entrepreneurship. I think that's why the podcast took off. Like it just created its own sort of community angle, blah, blah, blah. And so I think eventually we got to a point where we were like, yeah, let's just put out an episode every day. We have enough of a network that we're building. Let's get people on, ask them the hard questions, tell them we're going to ask them the hard questions. And if they don't want to, you know, participate, that's fine. Uh, and on, from that, then we built a community around it. And then one thing led to the next and it just started growing, growing, growing. Would I recommend you to start a podcast? I think it's a fantastic excuse to talk to people. Like yeah. The amount of networking opportunities you get just by like having conversations like this is phenomenal. I don't think you can do that in any other setting. So if networking is like your key area of what you want to build, I think a podcast is fantastic. Like we got into Apple top 20 charts and all of that, but that was all a byproduct of doing stuff that we yeah. love doing, which was talking to people. So if I wasn't like, if I wasn't building Let's Level Up, 
I would probably be doing some shape or form of podcasting just for my own sanity and just because I want to talk to people and I love talking to people. Um, and so that's eventually why, why I would advise someone to do it. Obviously, it helps you with your branding and like eventually maybe Let's Level Up will eventually have a podcast uh, because why not? I mean, the ability for you to have a conversation with people in your niche, uh, that's a very separate like topic altogether, but like podcasting as a mechanism, it's still not as red ocean as you think it is. There's a lot of avenues to actually grow. It's a medium that's just about picking up um, as opposed to other forms of social media and the habits of listeners that like, like, people are changing. Like you want to listen to a podcast when you go into work, which wasn't necessarily the case like five to 10 years back because well, you wanted to listen to music or maybe you didn't have the technology to actually listen to uh, stuff in the first place because the technology wasn't that advanced or uh, internet wasn't there. Like there's so many of these trends that are like playing out in the macro that will just influence a lot of the decision making of the actual end listener. Uh, so I think it's a great place to start, but I like, don't do it for the heck of doing it. I don't yeah. do it because you want to get famous. Don't do it because you know you can uh, eventually charge millions for your podcast. That's, that's <laughs> actually not going to happen. Like it's a very, very, very slim chance that that's actually going to happen. But if you're doing it for the reasons of building your own brand, if you're building, if you want to build your own network, if you want to just improve on communication as a skill set, it's a fantastic place to get into. Yeah, okay. I think like for me also, like in school, I don't think I was as confident yeah. a speaker as I would. I still don't think I am, but like relatively yeah. to what it was. So I think like I agree with that. And also the network aspect of it, right? Like you speak to such cool people that are doing different things mm. that you just like learn from them yeah so yeah i think that Anuj and i always discuss are like having a podcast is a very selfish thing yeah like it's not necessarily <laughs> yeah. necessarily for like anyone yeah, yeah. else or anything else it's like more for us yeah and also um like you said like if the goal is to become it's not that easy right like it's not like oh you put on episode one and like it goes viral and yeah. like you made it yeah so like to have that kind of, like your motivation has to be something else or you're not gonna like push through it because yeah. it's a lot of work um and like energy and time that you're putting into something for the wrong reasons yeah if that makes yeah sense. but yeah like so let's level up you started that after you started that with luke who was also your co-founder so you co-founded your company with friends how was that journey because like we've friends and we work <laughs> together and there are ups and downs so like um, how did that go? Yeah, um, doing it with friends is, uh, is, is, I don't know, like, would I suggest doing it? I think so. I mean, uh, I've had experiences where you've been friends with someone for a very long time and started something or co-founded something and it will fall flat. Um, but would I do it again? A hundred percent. Because you don't, like, your co-founder is like, like a marriage, like you, you, you're going to be with them more than you're going to be with your uh, significant other or your part, your romantic partner or your husband slash wife. Like you live and breathe the same air and the ideas and yeah. thoughts with your co-founder. So if you're not very comfortable with that person, like how are you going to do that? And I think the number one problem is like we focus so much on the idea. Um, it's a great idea, but like ideas change. Yeah. But the people that you surround yourself with and that you build with don't. And so you almost want to optimize always for building the right team and then figuring out the idea, then vice versa. Uh, would I advise doing it? I mean, as long as you know that like it's, it's going to be a very incredibly hard process, you're going to disagree on very, very many things uh, and you're okay with that. Some relationships aren't okay with that. Like you can be friends with someone for like years and not know that person at all. Or you can be with someone um, who you really like, but they don't, they're not good with conflict. So as long as like radically honest with your co-founder uh, and you're radically uh, okay with, with, with just having that, con that, that very diff those difficult conversations, right? Because you will have them yeah. and you're going to have a lot of fights. There are probably going to be days where you just keep fighting. And I mean fighting in a way where like, you just don't agree on things. If you're okay with that, go ahead. And, and. Just putting it out there, make sure your legalese are in place. You've signed contracts. Uh, if you're building a company, you better make sure that there's a founder's agreement. Uh, you have equity splits very clear. And in the worst case, what happens when somebody wants to leave or there's an adverse way that someone has to leave? 
Um, make sure all of this is the tightly ironclad, signed, you get your lawyer's approval. Because <laughs> at some point, this is going to happen. And, and the last thing is have a conversation with a co-founder to say, what if I get a job tomorrow and I want to leave? What then? What's the protocol then? Because you can discuss all of this and preempt it yeah. and be ready for it. Or you risk the your entire relationship going for a toss when you actually get to the end and say, oh my God, this is a problem and it's really bad. Yeah, no, fair enough. And I think like ideas, they do change, right? Like even that's level up, you're pivoted a couple of times of once, mm -hmm. twice. So like um, the idea can change, but like who you're starting it with is what matters. And like, do you remember what Ananya said? Like, so one of, um, the, one of our <laughs> guests that came, she said that like co a co-founder relationship is a marriage with no divorce clause. <laughs> so like you need to really like, and that really stuck with me because it's like, okay, fine. Like you have to, through like thick and thin, like work with the person through the ups and downs of the company. Yeah. So like you need to make sure that you work well with that person. But why did you laugh when he said conflict? No, you're not very good at handling conflict. <laughs> but you don't need to laugh. I don't think most people are very good at handling conflict. And I think that's a, that's yeah. a very important skill to build as a, as a, as a founder because what better way to figure out how to uh, handle an objection or to deal with a fight mm. than to do it uh, with someone that you're building arguably the most important thing that you're building uh, in your life. Um, and so I think it's a, yeah, it's a very good skill to have. Um, there's also a point where you, you reach in your entrepreneurial journey where you just have zero ego. Like you've eaten so much shit in your, like in your journey yeah. that like, it's like, whatever you tell me now, I'm just going to be like, thank you. I accept it. I'm going to work on it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's, I, I think that's my coping mechanism because like, there's no other way to grow than to get excruciatingly difficult feedback and from the people that, you know, uh, love you the most, um, hopefully they love you the most. <laughs> uh, but I think also like, for example, for me, conflict is the, like my first thing when I see conflict arising, because it also arises with a bit of tension in your head, mm. a bit of, you know, temper. So my first thing is always. Hey, let's speak tomorrow. Like that's step yeah. one. Then you know, diffuse the situation by just stopping the conversation in the moment. And then by the time tomorrow comes around, you realize it's a small problem. Yeah, there's here's the solution. That's yeah. generally it's worked really well for me. Yeah, like it's I, I absolutely love that, and I'm, I'm slightly jealous that you can do that. So there are these different types of communication styles. Right? So for me, I'm a very anxious communicator, and you're more of a relatively relaxed communicator. So uh, if we have a conflict, my first reaction would be let's solve it today. <laughs> and then before we go to bed, I need it done. You're going to be, okay, maybe we do it tomorrow. And it's great because I think a buffer really helps. And that's something that I've had to work on myself. Um, so I think like a middle ground obviously is, is good, but it's also yeah. really important to understand like your partner's communication style. Uh, Cause if I'm an anxious communicator and you go and tell me, Hey bro, tomorrow, not right now. <laughs> I'm going to get like, I'm going to get very frustrated. But if we go, look, I understand you're really upset. But like, I think here's what we need to think about. So maybe let's take time tomorrow. So it's like the way I'm saying the same thing. Yeah. I'm saying a very different way. That's the thing. So when I, when I know the person I'm speaking to is like an anxious person in general, that I, I, I haven't learned enough about like different communicator types, but if I know they're an anxious person, I just tell them, Hey, we'll figure it out. Don't worry about it. Let's speak tomorrow. Mm. And that generally seems yeah. to be fine. Um, but I, I do get what you mean. A lot of conflict. Yeah. can be resolved if you just give it 20 minutes <laughs> yeah. and that's something I've learned in, in, in a very hard way uh, but I'm glad I learned it sooner rather than later. I've had times where I've like you know gone off because I, ha I, I have a bad temper so that's yeah. why I've had to like work on it yeah. a lot more because I'm like I know I say the wrong thing it's, in the moment. Yeah. <laughs> I just don't communicate. Like <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 so 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 yeah. So like there, there are different kinds. Of, that's why I said like yeah. different kinds of communication styles. Right? So there's an anxious communicator that wants to over communicate and like yeah. you want to get stuff done and like resolve today. And there's the other on the other extreme, which is what you're saying, which is I don't want to communicate at all. I'm gonna I'm gonna go completely inward. I'm gonna go into a cocoon and not talk. And then there's a the middle person that's relatively balanced. Ideally, I mean it's it's a dream to have that person that's balanced. Very unlikely. But as long as you're aware of it and you know which area to work on, I think that you can find a balance. Yeah. Having a perfect balance will not exist. Like you, it just, it's not going to happen. I mean, you have to put intention behind 100%. it, right? Like you know yourself aware of like what kind of, like yeah. where you are on the scale. So that's where you, that's where you can put yeah. in thought behind like, okay, fine. Generally, I do not communicate. I'm going to self 
yeah. reflect and think of how to solve this on my own. But like, if I'm aware of that in that situation, then you put up the effort of being like, okay, you need to communicate with the other person to come on the same page. I and fundamentally so, believe that every relationship, romantic, friendship, business, starts and ends with communication. Mm-hmm. And if you're not able to do it effectively, and it's a two-way street. So if I communicate really, really well, or I want to communicate really well, and my partner is not able to do that, it would break yeah. eventually. Um, and so I think communication is the most important skill. I don't think we put enough emphasis on it. I think it should be taught in schools more than <laughs> any other subject. Because like this is the fundamental uh, crux of human uh, relationships. And what are we if not yeah. you? What yeah, are we if not with our own connections and relationships? Yeah. Fair enough. I'll have one last thought. I also feel like no matter what you do, like for example, I do try to, I, I think of myself as decent with conflict, but it also depends on the situation, right? Mm. Like now the daily conflict is something I'm very good with, mm. right? Like, I don't know, someone came to work late or, you know, let's say we disagree on how to edit a video, small stuff, like you get good with it. But let's say tomorrow there's a situation where she's like, where she's like, hey, I know about a job. Um, so, you know, it's going to be a little difficult with taking money. Even now in that situation, the emotions that are inside your head, etc., are much higher. Yeah. And that's when, you know, maybe your framework breaks down. Yeah. But then once you've dealt with that, you then get used to a, a higher level of conflict. Yeah. And that's yeah. all that happens. Yeah. Like you just keep yeah. learning to deal with bigger I think your, your communication, uh, it's very true. Like no one's going to be perfect at communication. You can only try to get one, but a little bit better every, every interaction you have. Uh, as long as you're aware and have intention behind it. No, no, fair enough. And we briefly went over your pivot. So like you did have a pivot at um, that level up. So what was your like thought process through it all? And yeah. how did that happen? Yeah, so like let's say I started as a very simple idea. We said like we, we think the current education system uh, is going to need fundamental disruption because like over a billion people by 2030 are going to need to be upskilled. Um, and the current systems of, of, of teaching and learning just don't work, right? So you'll have like an Udemy or a Coursera, uh, you know, doing courses, but then those courses have like 3% completion rates. Like what happens to the, to the 97% of people that drop off? Or schools and universities are great, uh, but they, you know, to get to like an enhanced curriculum, you have to go through so many barriers. So by the time the curriculum is launched, there's something new that's happening. So like then if you agree to all of this, then you, you also agree that learning needs to be continuous and learning needs to be proactive, which is basically learning by doing. And so the only way to do that in our, uh, in our research was a pedagogical construct called uh, pedagogy is like the way you teach. So like, what is that construct? So that's cohort based learning, which is five to, you know, maybe 20, 30 people in a, in a course could be online, uh, but you have a synchronous, which is like a live medium. And then you have an asynchronous, which is like a pre-recorded medium. And so you do all the stuff that you need to do that you can learn asynchronously, like reading uh, or watching. And you come into the classroom uh, or the Zoom room and you <laughs> have a conversation with the people. And so, and then by the end of it, you have projects that you do. Now that's great, right? Like theoretically, that makes sense. There's a lot of research, there's a lot of literature. And like, there's an incredible quote that says like, everybody has a plan until they're smacked in the face. And so we try doing it, right? So like. The way I like to build businesses is like, if you have an idea, just go test it out. And like, if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, it's fine. At least now you know it doesn't work. So let's, let's move on. So we did it. So we, we reached out to uh, some of our alumni from, uh, from Hillspring. And uh, we said, you know what? You're doing this for a while. There was one person in graphic design. There's one person in, uh, in UX design. So, okay, can we, can we just uh, run this cohort? It did very well, but then here's a the problem. We were eventually making a marketplace. And marketplaces hardly ever make money yeah. uh, unless you're able to front an exceptionally high, high margin of like just pumping in marketing dollars. Uh, it's very difficult to scale a marketplace. Uh, and so we soon realized that we were also tackling the funding winter. And don't forget, we were naive 20 year old kids out of university, <laughs> 20, 21 year old kids. Like raising money at that age is extremely difficult to do because you have zero backing of pedigree behind you. Um, and so we said, it's a sink or swim. What do we do? Um, cause it's a great idea, but like it's execution wise, it's going to be a marketplace model and it's not going to work. And but we also soon realized is that the tech that we were building as a use case for running our own courses and yeah. programs, um, was, was something that people were very, very, very interested in. So 
interestingly, when your podcast does very well, right, and people knew that we were in the Apple Top 20 charts for a while or whatever, people then come to us and say, can you teach me how to podcast? Like, that's great. People want to now learn yeah. from me. And so you're like, okay, let's do a cohort-based course on that. And then we went through every single uh, sort of software provider that came to help with teaching online. And it was just broken. You had to use five to 10 different tools. Uh, you know, there was one that would do learning management. There was one that would do content management. There would be one that would do uh, your payment processing. And then you'd have to use Zapier to zap all these things together. And it just breaks. And for someone who is not very technologically literate, like it's just, it's painfully frustrating. So like, you know, dozens of interviews later, like we realize like it's not just our problem. It's a very collective problem that people face. We're like, so then we're also building a tech behind it. So like, let's, let's put marketplace on hold. Can we build the tech to actually serve? And that's how that whole idea behind like a business in a box came around because then it's like, I'm, we basically now been able to eliminate five to seven different tools. Uh, and just, you can use now one tool. So it's like one source of truth. And the whole idea is we still want to serve the creator. We still want to serve the teacher. We still want to serve the subject matter expert. But the way we're doing it now is you anyways are building your own community. You know, marketplaces take up a substantial amount of money because they are marketing it for you. People don't like that. They're anyways building their audience. They're anyways going on social media, but they don't have the technology that's smooth enough to create a one-stop shop solution that will then facilitate an end-to-end -end play where you're like building, marketing, scaling, growing, all of that under one roof. So that's that's where the pivot came. Uh, and that's what we, we raised uh, our round on. Yeah. Yeah, so speaking about, I guess, raising, um, what was that journey like, given that you're more young? Horrible. Uh, <laughs> I took the I took the sole ownership of fundraising uh, because I very quickly realized that it's going to be an incredibly painful process. So there's someone that needs to run the business and there's someone that needs to fundraise. Um, and it took an excruciatingly long period of time. Um, there were term sheets. So, I don't, so term sheets are basically, uh, you know, there's like a, agreement yeah, that yeah. I'm going to put in money, but it's not legally binding. So you can very well understand if when I say a term sheet gets pulled just days before money gets deployed yeah. into your bank, how painful that feels. So there was one thing where we were like, we weren't necessarily running out of cash, but for how long can you keep um, not paying yourself, for example, yeah. or for how long can you rely on just four people uh, who are working minimum wage? Uh, to do certain tasks for you. Uh, so, it, it, you know, you, you you get this feeling of like these, these walls closing in and you're like, oh my God, there's no way out. So I don't remember the time in my life where I have uh, cried so much as I did in that six months of fundraising. Um, I, used to, I used to wake up with anxiety, go to sleep with anxiety. Um, every day I used to get panic attacks. Um, and every other day I used to be in the bathroom just crying my eyes out because all you're doing every day is waking up to a no, like, sorry, this is not a good fit. Sorry, the market's too saturated. But the beauty is you just need one yes. Uh, and everything else is history. Uh, so I don't know where I got the, the strength. I don't know what the, the thing was, but like when you put yourself into a sink or swim situation, like something just comes. Um, and I'm very grateful that it did. Uh, but yeah, it was a horrible process. Very, very, very painfully. Um, you know, we were raising at the time where everything was collapsing. The economy was collapsing. There was the the, the, the war. Um, market sentiments were horrible. Ed tech, which is kind of where we flirt the lines uh, with, was not doing very well because there was just like dramatic spillover effects from India, especially. Um, so yeah, it was just the worst time to fundraise. Um, and it was, the, the most horrendously horrifying experience I've ever had in my life. Do you have a count of how many knows you heard? Probably close to 150 to 200. Yeah. Wow. Um, I, I, think I, I think I still have an Excel spreadsheet uh, of like just red, 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 <laughs> yeah. red, red. And when you go back and you ask them like, what is it? Why? Nobody gives you an answer. Yeah. And that's the most painfully frustrating part. Um, but then you also recollect the times where like the first person said yes and then the second person said yes and then the first person connects you to the third person that person says yes and so like then then there's momentum that builds up a snowball effect yeah and then eventually we had a couple of term sheets from venture funds and we had a couple of term sheets from angel investors 
we chose the angel investor route, and I'm very glad we did that. And we we said no to 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 any to um, to venture funds. The choice then it's luxury at that yeah. point. It's luxury, but it's also very very difficult because again, like you need to remember we're first time founders. We don't we don't know what we're doing. Like I'm building my third startup, but it's a proper startup. Yeah. yeah. Uh, with with people who are employees. Team, yeah. You have <laughs> but you have cash flow. Uh, you know, there's there's employee contracts. Um, so we didn't know what we were doing as in like we knew we made decisions based on what we knew best. And to the grace of God and the universe, like we were able to fundamentally have good advisors who guided us all along the way. Uh, but horrible journey uh, <laughs> of fundraising. It was just so painful. Fair enough. So let's move to our next segment. Now this is called Two Truths and a Lie. Um, Basically, the idea is you give us three statements from your entire journey. It can be challenges, achievements, personal, business related, up to you. Two of them have to be true and one of them has to be a lie. And then we're going to guess which one's a lie. Okay. Um, okay, so first statement. Um, I have cried every alternate day for the last six months uh, during, my, uh, during the first day that I started. The business. Um, Let's level up has been the same, uh, pretty much the same idea and ethos ever since we started. Um, and the third is probably um, the creator economy is going to explode in the next three to four years. I'm going to go with the third one. The creator economy is going to explode. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll go with the second one that it's changed. So, like, yeah, you said that it stayed the same throughout, yeah. but I'm saying that that's a lie. Okay, and I give the answer now. Yeah, yeah it's the second one. Um, I mean, I thought of one, but I was like, <laughs> maybe the ethos was the same because he just discussed the bit. Yeah. I was too easy. <laughs> See, sometimes, me, sometimes, sometimes the answer is easy, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, so. Uh, Ethos was pretty much yeah. the same, but like there were a lot of small, small pivots. And as for the creator economy, uh, I do think it's going to become a very, very big uh, space. Uh, but the question will be whether it's a monetizable space that you can build a concrete business on. Uh, that is something I don't necessarily have that much conviction on. So one of the key pivots that we made was also in movie target. So we started looking at like creators. Uh, but if you start target, so the way you build brands in the creator space is like you you probably like get like four to five like top creators, and then you build a brand halo, and then that's how you build yeah. your entire. Especially if you're doing a marketplace one, the problem with doing that is everybody is going after them. So if you don't have the cash, you don't have the clout. Yeah. Uh, so it's like it's not like I'm an influencer. Today, yeah. Uh, or at least not not yet. And so like I can't go. To why will they choose you? Yeah. Why yeah. will they choose me? Um, and so. That is what I meant by like, is it, is it a monetizable space? Um, and can, can great billion dollar companies be built on in that space? Maybe, uh, but you know, do I have that conviction today on that? No. So that's why we then pivoted into like small business owners that are doing these coaching. So like the coaches that we serve or the, the subject matter experts that we serve or the businesses that we serve, they're small businesses uh, and then they go on to slightly SMEs or like slightly larger businesses. And they usually, um, they have their own small community. So you'll never probably know of them, but they're doing fairly well for themselves because they've formed a small niche. Uh, they run targeted ads uh, and they'll do a specific course or a specific coaching program for a specific niche. Uh, and so that's one of the key learnings that I had was like, you don't have to go and build this extremely fluffy business with like yeah. clout and like PR and press. You can build a very sustainable, growing, very quickly growing business. Uh, in a in a niche that's probably very unsexy, but it's the unsexy businesses that actually work. Yeah. So that was an interesting learning. You take plastic bottle label and cap manufacturers. <laughs> yeah. They do five thousand, six thousand crores of revenue yeah. per year. Yeah. It's not a very sexy business. Yeah. 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 But five thousand crores. Exactly. That and also a lot of people are now targeting micro influencers, people with smaller communities yeah. Yeah. and like smaller, I guess. Cloud than yeah. the big ones because A, yeah, everyone's going after them. But B, like, how can one person sell so, so many, many things? Yeah. Like, after a point, you're not going to be able yeah. to, like, 
believe what they're trying to sell because it's so just, your creator will also like a, 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 an influencer today will reach a point of saturation on what they can sell and to whom yeah. they're selling to uh, so if i go to a fitness brand influencer like how many fitness apps will they keep endorsing yeah. Yeah. until me as an audience realizes like this guy is just going on and off yeah. yeah this person is just making money yeah and so then the credibility money. goes down yeah. and so like then it becomes it almost backfires over a period of time Oh, fair enough. But yeah, moving on to our next segment, it's called red flags. So we're going to give you three situations. Each situation has two good things and one bad thing, which is the red flag. And then you have to choose which situation you would rather be in. So situation one, Let's Level Up has sold over 5,000 exports. Let's Level Up has successfully raised another round of funding. Uh, but there has been an increased uh, employee turnover given the complete remote model you'll have. Situation two, you have a compelling offer for acquisition. Let's Level Up has been a key enabler for the exports to create a cult-like community. Um, but your investors and the founding team do not see eye to eye on the next steps of the company. Uh, situation three, Let's Level Up successfully expanded to 25 international markets. You have massively contributed towards revolutionizing modern education, but Let's Level Up has not been able to raise another round of funding. So those are your three situations. In the last situation, what does my cash reserves look like? <laughs> That's unknown. Okay. Take the current trend of your business. So I have to uh, pick... Choose which of these situations you would rather be in. Right. Okay. So I think situation three where we've expanded to 25 international markets and we've massively contributed to revolutionizing modern education, but we haven't raised another round of funding. Um, I'd be completely comfortable with this if we were a cash flow positive company, um, which is what our goal is. So hopefully every expansion comes with a necessary amount of fiscal discipline, uh, which is what we've done for a very long time. So in that case, like I would, I'd be very comfortable not raising around. And that's ideal actually, like we don't want to be reliant on uh, venture funding at all. Um, and so if that is the case, then great i would much much rather be in situation three <laughs> however with expansion comes its own necessary problems um and so you might need growth funding so if we're not able to raise around there then that's a situation that i don't want to be a part of so in that case i would much rather um look at situation two because the compelling acquisition offer means that we're probably doing something correct and again it's it's a matter of communicating at the end of the day what the end outcome looks like for all of us. And I think I have enough faith in my co-founders uh, and in my board uh, to know that we will make the best decision for the company, uh, not maximizing for any personal uh, outcomes as much as for the company outcome. And so I think if someone has a compelling acquisition offer, that means they're doing something really correct. And if they say that it's not the right time, and if my investors say it's not the right time, then maybe I listen to them and maybe we wait and grow it even further until we get to a better acquisition offer or oh, ideal. <laughs> Fair. I think, you know, earlier when you said that, um, you had mentioned earlier that you didn't want to go into the uh, marketplace business because yes, you need to burn a lot of marketing dollars to get to a decent level because that's a volume business yeah. Yeah, per transaction fee. And the moment you said that, I felt like the third situation might just be up your alley because you're not trying to you know, fun burn, fun burn, fun yeah. burn. You want to like eventually just make sure that your revenues can be recycled yeah. to grow the business. So, yeah, I think that's pretty much the same yeah. mindset. I I, don't, I think we're so fixated. I I was very fixated on like raising the next round and like getting the clout and getting the press and the PR because everybody was doing that in, yeah. in your circle. Like everybody celebrates funding. No one celebrates profitability. No one's actually like talking and shouting on the rooftops about like, I went cash flow positive this month or I broke even this month. And that's actually a metric that, that works. If you cut away all the fluff and think about business from a first principles approach, there are only two things that matter. You build a decent enough product and you sell. Yeah. And that's it. Everything else is secondary. Funding, fundraising helps you quicken the process, but it is not the process. Really, funds also just became trendy, right? Yeah. Like, it was supposed to be for like tech companies, 
but not like everyone is raising yeah. funds and it's like okay it's cool that i was able to raise this or my valuation is so and yeah. so so i think it was more under that pretense is what everyone is going at. and yeah no one really on linkedin you're going to just keep seeing people talk yeah. about like raising funds it's so it's so debilitating because like we raised a decent amount of money we were very happy about it we got press okay like good amount of press we got yahoo finance bizzing up market watch covering up it lasted for a whole of good two days where you feel good <laughs> and then you go on linkedin and someone's probably raised triple of what you got yeah and then you just feel so bad and that, that time you don't remember all the nights of your life and you're like oh my god this person raised triple <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a never ending race like yeah. it's it, so might as well focus on the fundamentals of the business and this was not my thinking so like a huge shout out to my uh, third co-founder now who's 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 also like who's gone through enough of these startups to realize like um fundraising is not the goal yeah you know, it's it's the mechanism to enable the goal to take place so you know, and you take money like one of our one of the previous founders we had on the podcast so she's the founder of a company called tally.so mm-hmm. it's a form building software yeah, yeah. so much you you know that yeah, yeah, yeah. so they've not raised funding mm-hmm. and they would so her and her partner who are co-founders plus i think they've got four people working with them um least i think 100000 monthly revenue rate without ever raising funding okay. and that's an insane yeah. figure yeah. and, and they have a free premium model like yeah. a lot of their services are free, free. 99% that's the yeah. that's the uh number they use 99% of what we do is free to use yeah. and the 1% if you want to use it that means you really want to be a pro user then you get the subscription yeah. i love that it's such yeah, a it's really nice. yeah and yeah imagine if they went for funding today Yeah, you're doing a lot less, raising a lot more. Hundred thousand monthly revenue yeah. rate. Yeah. This is insane. Cool. Let's move on to our last segment now. Like you know, shake things up, get a little excited because this is rapid fire, <laughs> self-explanatory. Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, so we we'll just dive right into it. How many all-nighters did you pull in your first year of Let's Level Up? I didn't pull that many all-nighters. Probably a few. I don't believe in all-nighters because your productivity will drop. at some point and then you'll be staring at a screen so you might as well get your sleep fair enough how many days of leave have you taken in the last year when you say leave what do you mean by leave is answering an email on a vacation uh, something no that's not that's fine like you that's not leave. leave yeah yeah i don't i'm not taking leave uh am i proud of it no i think i should take some time off to balance the mental health yeah but i haven't yeah. fair enough What is the scrappiest thing that you've done to build your business? <laughs> we have this goal between me and my co-founder. Uh, we had to send out at least a hundred uh, cold call messages or cold DMs or anything cold uh, in the first uh, couple of months of starting. Uh, so we did that for <laughs> seven days uh, a week, or at least five six days a week. We also sent twenty twenty five thousand messages or emails uh, per month, more than that maybe, and just kept going, kept going, kept going. Obviously, wow. like ninety percent of that would be a no, uh, but the ten percent that said yes now are customers and ten percent is an insane yeah. conversion rate. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> maybe I'm maybe I'm maybe I'm exaggerating. Maybe like two or three percent said yes. <laughs> the thing is, you need just one yes, right? Yeah. Like, and then the one yes becomes two yes, and then if you're if you're building a decent enough product, they'll they'll give you them work. value. There's and more then, than enough yeah. referrals that yeah. can set your business. Yeah, word of mouth is such an important thing that people yeah. do not put enough like. Yeah. emphasis on because so everyone goes on digital marketing so we like, had no money to spend uh, yeah. up, up until like recently and so we were like what do we do like the only thing you can do is free yeah. so the only thing you can do free is cold call people use automating software which i'm not necessarily proud of but i did what i had to do yeah. you can't spend uh, money you can spend time yeah, yeah. yeah. that's and so yeah. and then the only thing, and then you pay off your ignorance debt over time now we've started doing like digital marketing you know, which yeah. is a game changer for the business uh um, you shift in my perspective as well but um up until the start yeah. of yeah um have you ever questioned whether it was worth it, whether it was worth it in my fundraising days every day <laughs> every day what's your proudest moment with let's level up i was just believing that it would work and like just every day visualizing that something's going to come of it and when it actually did come when we raised our round and we hit those certain milestones revenue wise We built a team, grew it from like four people to twenty people. Like that was when I was like, you, you, you wake up one day and you're like, 
you, know, you, you pause from work, you go on a walk, and you're like, oh my god, like <laughs> there are people yeah. working with us, and like we have like over two hundred customers, and it was just the idea sitting in my co-founder's living room, like two years back, like that's just surreal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what's the weirdest place? Can I also add one last thing? Of I think like there's this there's this idea of like when you build something like this revenue and you know how many employees you have. But like the thing that makes me the most happy is when I hear a success story of someone being able to pay off their mortgage or take their kid to school or to go and pay for vacation or to quit their job because what they're doing uh, with us is actually working. Like that's the kind of stuff like that really sticks with you for a while and because it's tangible that. it's yeah. Yeah. in your life yeah. directly and that's how yeah. you see like the tangibility yeah um what's the weirdest place from where you work um has to be uh an airport a very busy airport a very common answer <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, or a very busy cafe because i don't necessarily like working too much in cafes interesting uh, what was your biggest sacrifice to make Let's Level Up possible? My mental health. Uh, undoubtedly. Uh, not a proud answer. And that's a continuous sacrifice. Yeah. 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 But I think the, the, it stems from not being, uh, not being very rigorous with like your connections with people. Because uh, it's like you're very busy and so like other people realize you're busy. So they're like, do I reach out to Varun? Well, what you should have been doing in the first place is you reaching out to them. And so I'm, I'm making those small changes uh, in, in ways wherever I can. Uh, so hopefully. I felt that too. I felt that too because like you get busy and then you say no to like two things, and then people like Stop. obviously you want to give you your space because yeah. they don't want unnecessarily yeah. ask you either. Yeah. And then you realize because you don't reach back out, yeah. suddenly you're in a space where it's like heading back into yeah. loneliness. Yeah. I get that. Uh, what is an what is a moment that had you go oh shit, good bad whatever. Oh shit was like the one that I told you about, like in a positive way, where it was like, wow, we're like, this, we actually really yeah. it. it's yeah. become a fairly decent sized business, revenue wise or like people wise. Uh, and I was like, my god, um, oh shit. Uh, I guess when you when you come to a realization that certain people, especially the the people that start the company with you, um, want different things, and they probably have to leave and you have to make a hard call on what that looks like that's hard yeah. and you say oh shit <laughs> in a very very different context then what was one time you felt like you let let's level up down so this was when my ocd actually came into the picture uh, the last couple of months like august to about 3 to 4 months from there uh, it was a very really dark time for my for me personally. There's just a lot of personal problems uh, going on, and so when that usually happens, there's an extreme level of anxiety, and I usually revert back to like these obsessions, uh, thought processes. Two things that really trouble me is one is when I have a decision to be made. Let's say we make a decision. Um, two hours later, I doubt that decision. So say so let's increase ad spend by twenty percent, and we do it. Then I call my co-founders up and say, sorry, let's actually reduce it back. And you keep doing that, it's going to really piss people off, yeah. very understandably. And then there are loops. So like, there are certain decisions that take a long time. Like There are a lot of, as you start growing the business, anything that you do today is not going to have an impact today. It's going to have an impact one week from now. Uh, and that mindset shift, you know, it takes time to sort of, sort of, because you're all constantly hustling every day. So that shift was eventually where it was like, Oh my god, in one week, what's gonna happen? If this happens, that happens, that happens. So you constantly go in those loops. So like, oh, Hannah sat me down and said, Look, Warren, this is getting a bit too much. Uh, I don't think we can work with you if you keep doing this. Um, and it was almost like this final. Uh, and they did, nothing that they said was wrong, uh, which was the, the part that was very difficult to swallow. So there were two days, Saturday and Sunday, uh, one of those weekends, uh, I, was, I was in a play, I got that message, I had to come out. We had a long conversation and for two days, all I did was sit with myself and say, what is going on? And so then obviously I, I, I self-corrected. So I went back and said like, let's make decision logs. And so I did all of that. But like, that was the one time I felt like I didn't necessarily let, let's level up now. Uh, but had I continued on that path, I would have. But what I did was I let my co-founders down. But the one good part about this was they communicated it and they communicated it fast and they gave me a chance 
to improve. And that is so important. Uh, it's a great case study that I'll take from my grade. What is your biggest fear? Not being enough. <laughs> like just the, uh, the complacency and not being able to get to a point where I feel extremely proud about myself. Yeah. Um, which hobby of yours did your work kill? Yeah. Uh, it was uh, being active. <laughs> uh, so I, I was a, in, in, you probably remember this, I, I used to compete properly uh, for badminton, like I used to play state and, and all that. Uh, so I was a very active uh, kid growing up, uh, and then as soon as the company came, like everything was a backseat. Uh, I obviously switched that around because it took a big toll on my mental health, physical health, all types of health. Um, and so I've, I've course corrected, but I think that, that's one of the big, uh, big hobbies that were, yeah, took a backseat. Do you prefer books or podcasts? Both. Uh, and the way I read books is through audio uh, and reading. So it doubles the time, uh, it quickens the pace, but it also improves my, uh, my memory of the book. So I'm using two basically uh, senses. Senses. And mm -hmm. podcasts, yeah, while traveling or... Do you prefer iPad or notebook? I'm trying the iPad, I'll see how it goes. <laughs> I like doing the notebooks, but like, I was like, why not try the iPad? Because it goes with me everywhere, or yeah. could go with me everywhere. Are you a morning person or a night owl? Yeah, I tend to be a night owl. I want to correct it though. And what's your favorite social media? There's WhatsApp, no, no. right? No. <laughs> uh, probably is YouTube and LinkedIn. But if I had to pick one, it would be YouTube. Nice. So that concludes the rapid fire segment. Now we're not. We're almost at the end of the conversation, but basically at the end of every episode, we ask our guests to ask our next guest the question. So first, we're going to ask you what, well, first we're going to let our previous guest ask you that question. Yeah. Okay, great. So my, my question for the next guest is, um, how do you go about deciding to pick up projects between creative satisfaction and commercial satisfaction. So yeah, looking forward to your thoughts. So how do you pick between commercial satisfaction and creative satisfaction? Yeah. So usually when we when we decide on on what uh, a project looks like, uh, there are two things that that I look at. I I think I can derive creative satisfaction one way or another. Otherwise, I wouldn't do what I'm doing. Uh, so I'm assuming that I have a certain level of creative satisfaction. Obviously, I'm not going to get as much creative satisfaction uh, doing one thing over the other. But the way I think of it is, I don't think these are mutually exclusive. If I don't focus on the commercial angle of a business or running a business, then I will never have the ability to have creative satisfaction. Uh, so if I do all things that I like to do, but it does not actually bring in revenue for the company, uh, then the company may not exist. And so I'm always, almost always prioritizing for that commercial uh, satisfaction to be then able to pursue my creative satisfaction. Um, and that's how I would optimize for it. Um, and the best way to do that is like, okay, so if I'm, you know, if we're launching a new ad campaign, uh, how much, what's the ROI on that? And then can I derive creative satisfaction? Can I write a script or can I record a video in a different way? Can I work with my co-founder to to find a creative way of, of, of saying a particular kind of thing. And so that's where the creative juices flow. Um, so I think you derive your creative satisfaction uh, and, and it depends on how you, what you want to make of it. Okay, let me, let me flip the question for you a little bit. Um, what's an industry that you really don't like? Like you genuinely dislike it um, from, an, from an emotional perspective? Uh, it would probably be like the tobacco industry. Okay. Now let's say there is a company, right, who is doing online courses on like tobacco making, like cigarette making. And they come to you saying, hey, why don't you like help set up our stack? And they're willing to give you 500,000 pounds. What's your answer? I think uh, we would create like very strict guidelines on that. So the way Let's Have it works is we're a white label solution. So we can't technically say no to you coming and doing it because like you can technically then sue us because the terms of conditions are whatever it is but in those clauses uh in the clause we do say that you know you can't you can't do certain things like not safe for work um 
un unless unless there's explicit approval given, which we will probably not give. And so like this is an ethics question. And so like would I allow someone uh, to 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 for cigarette making or like how do you create a, a perfect cigarette? Oh, no, no, probably no. not. Uh, and I'm justified in doing that because of my contract um, and the terms of service that I have for the. Um, now, if you find a loophole and try to trick the system and we don't find out, there's no way of me knowing, which is going to be extremely rare because we yeah. do very, very strict yeah. checks on who's using the platform, what they're, what they're creating, etc. Uh, so I don't think that would ever exist. Money will come. Uh, I think if you provide enough value in your, in your, in your uh, creating that momentum, like money will come. I don't think you're optimizing for money. This is a more of like an ethical dilemma and I think we as a team are very clear that like certain things are just not on and right. we will not allow that to take place on our platform even if we're a white label solution, even if we're a SaaS. The reason I wanted to flip the question was because Neil's um, question also comes from the fact that he is in a more creative right. business. Right. So, yeah, kind of to see how. No, but I, I think he took it correctly in the sense like, okay, yeah, would you choose a. Would you like, In any decision, do you prioritize creativity or do you prioritize commercial success? Like, do mm, you say that's, that's, yeah. yeah, that's like decision based. I was also thinking from the perspective of like taking on a client. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. But anyway, uh, Varun, thank you so much. Thank for you. It's been absolutely fun. No, thank you. It's been, it's been absolutely lovely. I feel like this is a podcast where it's going to be so difficult to decide the title because <laughs> we've spoken about like 100 different yeah, things. Yeah, it was a very nice casual flow. Yeah. It's very fun. I think we call this untitled. <laughs> <laughs> then the one's clicking on it. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, thank you so much. No it's been fun. Um, yeah, and I think we went in, uh, into a lot of detail about like mental health and stuff, yeah, which is so important in running yeah. a business. Mm. So, clicking on that. Yeah. Cool. So